Good evening. I'm Milton Curry, Dean of the USC School of Architecture, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you uh, to our Fall 2021 Public Event Series. And I'm very pleased this evening to have with us uh, Rahul Marota, uh, who will be speaking with you this evening. USC Architecture educates citizen architects. Uh, more and more, we're becoming a platform for global, social, and cultural issues. Centering the urban future in the precarity of our planet and our climate as ways in which to develop new methods to uh, examine architecture, urbanism, landscape architecture, conservation, uh, and other characteristics that, that are about where we are at this point in time. And I can think of no better person to um, converse with us on these issues than Rahul Marota. Professor Marota studied at the School of Architecture in Ahmedabad, where he received the gold medal for his undergraduate thesis and graduated with a master's degree with distinction in urban design from Harvard University. He has taught at the University of Michigan and at the School of Architecture and Urban Planning at MIT. Currently, Professor Marota is chair of the Department of Urban Planning and Design and the John T. Dunlop Professor in Housing and Urbanization at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. He also serves as director of the Master in Architecture in Urban Design degree program and co-director of the Master of Landscape Architecture in Urban Design degree program. He is a practicing architect, urban designer, and educator. His Mumbai and Boston-based practice, RMA Architects, was founded in 1990 and has designed and executed projects including government and private institutions, corporate workplaces, private homes, and unsolicited projects driven by the firm's commitment to advocacy in the city of Mumbai. The firm has designed a software campus for Hewlett Packard, a campus for Magic Bus, an NGO that works with poor children, has led the restoration of the Chamahala and Fulknama palaces in Hyderabad, and formulated a conservation master plan for the Taj Mahal with the Taj Mahal Conservation Collaborative, truly touching the areas of urban design, urbanism, architecture, and conservation. The firm has also recently designed and built a social housing project for 100 elephants and their caretakers in Jaipur, as well as a corporate office in Hyderabad. The firm has also designed several single family houses across India, one in Karachi, Pakistan. In 2015, RMA Architects completed the Lab of the Future on the Novartis campus in Basel, Switzerland, and were finalists in an international design competition from the Museum of Modern Art in Sydney. In addition to practice and teaching, Raul Marote has written and lectured extensively on issues having to do with architecture, conservation, urban planning, and design in Mumbai and India. His writings include co-authoring Bombay, The Cities Within, which covers the city's urban history right from the 1600s to the present, and other books. And I want to freestyle a little bit here um, because I've known of and then known Raul Marota for many years and have really respected um, the gentleman and scholar that he has uh, always been, uh, a very class act, but also uh, a very astute um, student of history and a very astute kind of predictor of things to come. And when I think about the movements in urbanism uh, over the last 20 years, whether it be new urbanism or informal urbanism, uh, landscape urbanism, um, Rural Marota has had a, a very astute and um, I would say a very sophisticated way of entering into these discussions uh, with a lens that is um, wrought from uh, personal experiences, uh, intellectual growth, um, a, a um, conviction around how uh, people and how architecture and people um, coexist in, in, a, in a form of uh, empathy. And that empathy, use, using empathy as a lens to think about um, the intellectual commitments and moral commitments of architects uh, has been a way of um, working, a way of teaching, and a way of producing um, thoughts and texts and books and conversations that uh, have lived on in the life of his students and all those that um, have interacted with him 
uh, in the institutions that he's been at and in conversations like these. Um, and so I want to thank him. Uh, thank you, Ron, for your intellectual generosity and your continued uh, importance and influence in an ever emerging uh, field of urbanism, urban planning, urban design uh, in cities. So with that, please join me in welcome Professor Raul Marota to our fall 2021 lecture series. Thank you so much, Milton. Thank you for those kind words. And I love the way you freewheel. That was the most fun part. So thank you very much for all of that and for the introduction and uh, foremost for this invitation to share some of these thoughts with your colleagues uh, at USC. So thanks again. Uh, so I'm going to just very quickly share my screen so I can get going. Great. Uh, okay. Uh, so thanks again, Milton, and uh, I here I'm going to sort of start and share with you uh, some thoughts and some work. Um, I call this architecture and context. I mean, context is something of a kind of definition or rubric we use, but how can we complicate it? And I think uh, for me, the key question is asking what is the context of the context? Because the context is the, the stuff we learn as architects, you know, the wind, the, the climate, the location, uh, the soil. Uh, what surrounds us on a site that we are intervening in. Uh, and for those of us who are perhaps more ambitious, you, you also look for embedded histories. And so context itself can be nuanced, right? But if you place the idea of the context in its context, that's, I think, uh, it, it really complicates the question because what I mean by the context of the context is the socio-political, cultural, kind of uh, surroundings within which your context uh, exists. Uh, and I think it's really critical to ask that question and to interrogate that question in this way, because it's really at those intersections between your understanding of what might be more tangible as the context in its larger context, which you could perhaps even extend to a kind of planetary dimension. Uh, and at that intersection are produced the most interesting thoughts. And I think the nourishment uh, for us uh, really as practitioners. And so I'm going to actually today share with you two practices. One, uh, my practice of research, and I call it quite mindfully a practice because I think that's how you discern the context of the context. And then I'm going to share with you three projects uh, which are located in very particular contexts. And I hope uh, what I will be able to communicate is how they were informed by their larger context. And so that really is the ambition of this presentation uh, this evening. So we use binaries as a start to organize the world around us. And while binaries are very useful ways to make these categories discernible, uh, they're not very productive for us as designers because we invariably become part of one world or the other, whereas actually our role is synthesizing. Uh, our role is imagining better spatial possibilities in which human beings can play out their lives. Uh, and so uh, I think uh, it's, 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 it's critical. Uh, sorry, is the screen share on? It's not. Can you go ahead and re-share that so we can oh double check? Okay. Uh, I just saw your message. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, now, yes? Yes, I can see it. We can go ahead and start. Okay. Anyway, there okay. were no images, so I think we're fine. Can you see it now? Yes, you're good. Okay, good. So I was on this slide of the context of the context, and I was on this slide now of the binaries. And so uh, the, the thing is, we actually are in the business or we, are, uh, we have the responsibility and are on us by society uh, to synthesize and to blur these boundaries, these binaries, and to create these sorts of third spaces. Uh, and I sort of have been, um, you know, in, through my research, uh, referring to the context I work in, which is Mumbai, is a kinetic city. And this is the third space, which is not about the formal and the informal and that binary, but about how one can dissolve these binaries. Uh, this is a city which is about incremental growth, incremental moves. People additively add and make themselves present on a particular landscape 
uh, ordinary street like this transforms during a festival and becomes a community hall. And in 10 days, it goes back to the ordinary street it was. Here, architecture is not the spectacle of the city. Here, there are other fe festivals, human-centric activities, associative values that are attached to space that become the spectacle of the city. Architecture is not the single instrument by which the city is organized. And I think this is an assumption that we have made uh, you know, where architecture in urban design is the central instrument. Uh, my belief is in the kinetic city, that uh, privilege also blurs and dissipates. Uh, it's not that architecture is not important, but it's not the only instrument by which uh, a city is formed uh, or, or constructed. This is quite different from uh, many cities around the world where architecture is the central instrument by which a city is organized and identified. Uh, and I call this the landscape of impatient capital. Capital is intrinsically impatient. Uh, and the terrains like Shanghai's and the Dubai's that make the landing and the realization of the value of capital frictionless become these landscapes uh, of, uh, of impatient capital. These are land landscapes that are made by that impatience of capital. Uh, whereas actually, uh, the reality, say, in a city like Mumbai, where I work, is quite different because when uh, capital hits the ground, it's not frictionless. Uh, it creates these sorts of disjunctures. It creates these sort of extended binaries. And so the question then becomes, how do you dissipate them? And I'm using this image emblematically, and I'll come back to this uh, in a project. This is an image from one of the projects I'm going to show you. But here I'm going to quote Martha Chen, Marty Chen, who is an authority on the informal economy. And she teaches at the Kennedy School of Government here at Harvard University. And she spoke in the context of economy. And that resonated deeply with me um, as an architect. And to quote her, she said what she was challenging the economists. And she said, what is needed most fundamentally is a new economic paradigm, a model of a hybrid economy that embraces the traditional and the modern, the small scale and the big scale, the informal and the formal. What is needed is an economic model that allows the smallest units and the least powerful workers to operate alongside the largest units and the most powerful economic players. And I'll come back to why I think this image is important. So really, in, in trying to negotiate the context of our context, we also then come upon this notion of our sphere of concern and sphere of influence. Our spheres of concern are expanding exponentially. Climate change, I mean, our concerns have become global, uh, you know, uh, uh, equity and justice and social justice and uh, you know climate change. I mean, it's it's endless. Uh, but our sphere of influence is actually diminishing. You know, so we recreate intellectually uh, by articulating our spheres of concern, and we wake up the next morning. You know, to really spend the next week or all our days in some addition to somebody's house, for example. Uh, and you know we it's or even doing a building it's meaningless in the context of what we've articulated uh, as our spheres of concern and so this disjuncture this expansion in terms of distance between the two is what we have to heal and i think one way of healing it is being ambitious to ask this question of what is the context of the context uh, that we uh, uh, that we operate in and so with that i'm going to make a segue into what i call my first practice which is the practice of research and this is not a practice that's driven uh, 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 it, it's, it's not research is not driven by the practice that is the needs of the practice, which is if we get a project to design a hospital that we're doing research on hospitals, that's part of, I think, the project brief. Research has to be independent. It has to be driven by our concerns. If we are willing to expand the sphere of our concern like we are doing, then we must respond by trying to understand those concerns. Uh, and then that will drive practice, not the other way around. And so they, one has been involved over the years in many kinds of research projects. My first decades as a practitioner, I was obsessed with the city I worked in, Mumbai. So these are publications and books that I produced on Mumbai. A lot of them collaboratively produced, co-authored, sometimes done as part of an institute, sometimes single authorship. But they looked at this. At that point, I was obsessed with urban conservation. And so these books sort of led to our sphere of influence expanding, which then led to the first legislation for urban conservation uh, in India, which was in Mumbai in 1995. Then that led to us as activists trying to actually work out business improvement districts, trying to affect conservation, involve people. It also led to us 
uh, you know, proposing as part of that whole narrative, how in this case, the Prince of Wales Museum in Mumbai, which is a kind of colonial structure, it wasn't being visited enough. It was bound because of security and with a series of interventions of visitor centers and security kiosks, all done in a very contemporary way. Uh, you kind of soften the boundaries or the thresholds for the museum. So it's not like because one was interested in conservation that led to urban conservation that led to being engaged, it also made the space because it, it actually broadened our influence. Uh, it allowed us to make propositions, uh, self-initiated propositions, which then resulted in projects uh, you know, for the city in a sense. And similarly, there was another way in that followed it where I got very interested in writing about architecture and that writing about architecture uh, led to uh, exhibitions, which became a forum to kind of uh, popularize and you know get a much broader public involved in the debate about architecture, uh, about writing on architecture, lots of metrics here, which are, this is a, a graph that shows how schools of architecture since independent independence, uh, independence in 1947 have gone from two or three schools to 428 schools. And it, this, this infographic tries to understand that. This was extended as an exhibition on the state of housing in India which resulted in catalogs, documentation of types uh, since independence, uh, again, for the public, but also for the profession, because it was about knowledge creation. Uh, and this was a, a, a document of uh, conversations over a whole year around the question of housing in India. And then the third strain that I've sort of been interested in, which is more recent, uh, is urbanism. Uh, where as an extension of the notion of the kinetic city of how one makes this third space, time became a very important dimension. The temporal dimension became very critical in my own understanding. And so uh, this was a very interesting interdisciplinary project that was university wide. Uh, and it was a, a project that was to map the Kumbh Mela. The Kumbh is a, uh, is a Hindu religious festival that happens on four and 12 year cycles. It's the largest gathering of human beings on the planet. And we took 40 students and 10 faculty from the university, from every school uh, virtually. Uh, and we went out uh, and lived there. Uh, it's a temporary city, uh, which gets built uh, on the confluence of the Ganges and the Yamuna. And till the monsoon is what you see in that satellite image. Uh, until October, the waters are flooding uh, uh, the, the, you know, the banks in a sense. And then in October, when the waters recede, the sand banks or the sand bars become visible on which the city is settled. And it's a city which accommodates 7 million people there for 55 days and over 100 million people visit it. But, and it's all built in a matter of six or eight weeks. Uh, and these are images from the same spot, that tree is the same tree. Uh, and we took that image in like early October or maybe late September, early October. Uh, and when we went back there on the 15th of January with our team, uh, that's what we saw. It's not a pop-up city, it's not a pop-up urbanism, but it's a deliberate government. That is, it's a state-led urban initiative, which accommodates, it's, you know, 7 million people. It's a mega city. And that's why we called it mapping the ephemeral mega city. It's on a grid. It's very robust. Every street goes across the river on a pontoon bridge. Uh, and the grid is allocated in a kind of democratic way. The entire city is made out of five materials. That's why it's a kit of parts. It can be assembled and disassembled. And it scales up using those five materials. When the, when the, when the festival is over, within a week, it's dismantled, leaving only the coir mats. Uh, and then two months later, the river floods again, leaving no memory of the city. And so this was a very kind of expansive experience. Uh, one learned a lot uh, from this. Uh, and, uh, you know, it kind of really began to uh, help me think about urbanism in some ways differently. And we were at that point invited to the Venice Biennale when Alejandra Aravena was the curator. And we thought, wow, what a good place to have a, a, a kind of um, provocation. And the provocation was, does permanence matter? Uh, and, you know, why are architects obsessed with permanence? Why is permanence a default condition, then reinforced with conservation and, you know, everything? It's all about the extension of life. Can't we think of our interventions more lightly? And what better place to have a provocation like that than the Venice Biennale, which is the center of architectural celebration and production, uh, in a sense? And these are just images, the whole 
installation where it was made in cloth and bamboo, so it could be dismantled, led to a book which is called Ephemeral Urbanism Does a Permanence Matter? And now the more recent project is actually looking more broadly at in India, what does urban even mean? Uh, and it's a book that will be out in a few months called Becoming Urban. Uh, it's trying to understand these patterns. So in these sorts of publications, we also capture what we do in studios. So you bring the academy in. I use the rubric extreme urbanism because I pick sites where the urbanism is in such extremities that it challenges our business as usual notions about urbanism. And the latest one I did was looking at sanitation as infrastructure. So really, this is one practice. Uh, which has resulted in a number of publications. Like I said, a lot of them are collaborative. Many of them are single authored. Some of them are studios, which are captured with the help of students uh, to really further some of this, what I call knowledge. The latest two books, which were of my pandemic uh, projects, um, uh, which gave me a lot of time to focus on, is what you see at the bottom here. It's called Working in Mumbai. And this looks at 30 years, reflects on 30 years of practice in India. And the one you see on the top there is called The Kinetic City and Other Essays, and that captures 30 years of writing. So one is about 30 years of projects and reflecting about them critically, and the other is uh, reflecting about writings and this part of the practice, which is research. So for me, these books are instruments of advocacy. Some of them might be scholarly, but most of them are, are, are about questions that are asked in a way uh, that they can empower other activists. Uh, we often take on the role of advocacy where we, we produce things and then we lobby for it. And sometimes we don't have the temperament to do all of that. And I think architects can play a critical role in producing the instruments for advocacy, which gives advocates that empowerment. Uh, and sometimes they're much better off at doing that. They can trigger off social networks, they're part of communities. So this could be community organizers, many other folks who are already advocates, sometimes they lack the instruments. And I think that's something that I've learned from this practice that I call my practice of research and publication. It has also taught me that we spend too much time on the practice of architecture. We need to think more clearly, more, more rigorously about the architecture of practices. How do we even organize our practice? What is that, what is that armature uh, within which we practice? And the construction of that armature is the architecture of practice. That's sort of very critical. The other thing that this has taught me is that we look at clients in a actually in a very simplistic way. You know, I have a client and the client has asked me to do this, but really every project has many differentiated clients. And so just for simplicity, uh, let's, let's look at three. One is what I call a patron client. One is what I call an operational client and the other is a user client. We often align with one or the other. So let's say a university campus, we land up either aligning with uh, the patron client, the president of the university who's handpicked you and you know you have their blessings and you can cry at their feet if somebody doesn't accept what you're doing. Or we align with the campus engineer or the campus architect who is the operational client. Or we align with the users and we don't get very far because then with students and faculty, we are revolting against the patron client, right? And so the architect's task is to get all these aspirations on the same table and negotiate them in a way that you get a building that reflects the aspirations of all three clients or aspects of the client. In a single family house, this collapses into one entity. All you deal with perhaps is a couple that might have a difference, uh, but otherwise it's frictionless. And that's why we do our best work of uh, doing single family homes. Uh, they're really frictionless often compared to most other projects. In government projects, this gets even more complicated. And so with that, I'm going to make the segue into sharing three projects with you. And uh, the three projects is where I look at a client that's a corporate client, where close to a single family home, these sort of collapse into one entity. But I'm not going to dwell just on this aspect. I've just, I'm, I'm trying to create this taxonomy so you know the challenges within each of these projects and in the forms of negotiations one might have had to do when, when one alludes to it. The second one I'm going to look at is an institutional project. And the third one is a government project. And this sort of differentiation, this fragmentation of the aspirations of the clients 
become more acute as you go uh, through the spectrum. So the first one is in Hyderabad. I mean, Milton mentioned the two palaces we've restored in Hyderabad, but we also did a contemporary building there. It's a corporate office. It's a hot, dry climate. We were part of what is called Cyberabad, which is a high-tech city. Every building you see there is um, a glass box, uh, except for the circular building, which Mario Botta did, which is clad completely in brick. Uh, our site was in a part that hadn't been developed. Now, uh, a lot has been developed. There was a public park that was reserved in front of us. And now this is all full of buildings. This is an old uh, Google image. Working here, I realized that the clients wanted a glass box because everyone had glass boxes. But I noticed that in a, in a place like Hyderabad, which is politically very contested, uh, most glass buildings had fishing nets uh, because uh, people were scared that if there was a riot, they'd their buildings would be stoned. Uh, and so when the glass suppliers, the vendors for glazing, uh, actually sold you glass, they actually had options for colors in fishing nets. They had the details for the fixing of the fishing nets. So it just tells you how compulsive or impulsive these sort of uh, 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 these images or this wanting the images or consuming the images of impatient capital are. This is the image that goes with globalization. It goes with internationalism. It goes with capital and global capital, and people were just blindly building like this. And this we found to be very problematic. And so we began to look for solutions. Uh, at that time, we were uh, doing a project in, uh, in Jaipur, uh, and uh, we, were, we were fascinated by this little hut. It's a water cooler. That guy works for the association and the government that has 300 of these put up every year in the summer. That's his kettle. Uh, and he serves you water free of charge. There are no plastic cups, so it's totally sustainable. You use a little water to clean your hands. You smile at him, thank him, and go away. It's, it's a social service. And it's, he comes out once in a while and humidifies the hut. So through evaporative cooling, it stays cool. Within the hut, all the water is in earthen pots, which also are porous. So through evaporative cooling, they keep the water cool. The water is hygienic, hygienic and he serves you you know, as part of the social service, which a business association and the government collaboratively do. We found this fascinating and we were inspired by this. And we came up with a corporate office, which was a five-story high garden. Now, it wasn't a green facade when you stick the green on the facade and, you know, with, uh, I don't know, they do this in Europe and other parts, but this was a performative facade where there was a misting system in uh, the, the facade, which would cool the plants. Uh, and allow cool air uh, to flow through the building. So it's got cross ventilation. Uh, the plants are fed through a hydroponic tray. So it's not wasteful use of water. Uh, the water is only used to cool the building. Uh, and every facade is different depending on the orientation. What you see is the glass boxes or the conference rooms, which protrude out to create uninterrupted views. So every facade is a different pattern. We experimented. Our mock-ups were the nursery mock-ups to see how fast plants would grow and uh, how they would sort of sustain the sun, what seasons, and all of that. Uh, and we built this facade, uh, a handmade the facade using recycled aluminum alloys. And we um, you know, uh, convinced the client who wanted to occupy the building that you can occupy it, but give us two or three years to develop the facade, which became a separate kind of detached project. Uh, which was interesting. It was a way of also circumventing what uh, glass vendors sell to the client, which is we can finish the building in six months. Uh, and so we had to negotiate and strategize all those forces that were kind of undermining what our aspirations uh, for the building were. Uh, and so it, you know, it, this is how it sort of uh, uh, grows. Uh, the planting becomes a kind of a hairy and woolly monster, and then it's sort of given a haircut and it goes back to this pristine facade and it kind of ebbs and grows. Uh, it has a misting system. You can see the clouding, so you can have very light mist, uh, which keeps it very cool. Sectionally, it's also uh, articulated in a way that the hot air through these atriums and courtyards can kind of ventilate. The podium becomes a social space uh, and, um, you know, and uh, has lemongrass, which uh, keeps mosquitoes away. And every facade has different kinds of flowers. Uh, and it's really, it's these two, one is a courtyard atrium and one is uh, uh, an, an atrium which allows the hot air uh, to extrude. And this is programmatically divided. And the, the, the kind of cheese you see in the sandwich is the tendering and the finance department, which needed complete privacy. We did this intuitively. We are beginning to now map it. 
The building you see in the corner up there on the left is a building that got a LEED certificate, which made the clients ask us to try to get a LEED certificate. And we never got a LEED certificate because our windows weren't sealed. We didn't have fancy air conditioning. Now, of course, we have a, a, another metric in India called Greha, uh, which sort of adapts uh, these sorts of metrics for passive cooling uh, and localizes it in a sense. And here, the shadow of the plants become uh, you know, the ornament. I come back to this image. And I come back to this image. This is an image uh, intern from Panama City who worked with us for six months, wanted to visit the building, took. It's not a professional photographer. It's a lovely image, but it tells you a great story. A friend of mine said, you've really created green jobs because you are the poorest people in the building, which are the gardeners, are actually empowered because the identity of the building depends on them. Uh, and so that's why the gardeners can walk anywhere in the building on this catwalk, all five floors. They can look into the managing director's cabin. No one else has, no one has privacy from them. People can choose to put their blinds down. They never do. There's great empathy for everyone in the building. And so the least powerful workers here get empowered, even if it is, uh, it is uh, emblematic or it's visual or it's a gesture. Uh, it, it is, it, it has meaning because through that come empath comes empathy uh, and recognition. Uh, and, you know, there are wonderful stories you hear about how people befriend the gardeners to get bouquets and they, they, all sorts of conversations occur. So they really are the heroes of the building. Again, this is not a photograph I staged because I would have moved the wire and the newspaper. But when you walk into someone's cabin, that's what you see. Uh, and there's a kind of easy relationship. They often greet each other. You know, if in a conventional building, the gardeners would have been, you know, deweeding a lawn, sitting on their haunches while the boss would have driven in a, you know, black tinted glass Mercedes Benz to the parking lot and never made eye contact with the least powerful workers. But here the most powerful workers and the least powerful workers in a way in the building uh, are, are separated by a very soft threshold. And I think this is not something we set out to design, but by default, uh, and the feedback loops that we established in understanding the building, we learned uh, from it. And that's how it sits with the public garden in the foreground. It virtually sort of grows out of the garden in a lovely way. The second building is an institutional building. It's a library on a campus um, in Ahmedabad, which is the architecture school. I studied here. That's why it was a very difficult project. Uh, the campus is designed by B.V. Doshi. Uh, and um, we were asked and to do what was the first non-Doshi building. So we were the first ones building on this campus after he had built a number of buildings here. Uh, and they asked us to do the library. And they gave us a site, which is where you see the square footprint. Uh, and it was a very difficult site and the program needed six stories. Uh, and it was just, wow, how do you kind of intervene, intervene in a contemporary heritage campus, you know, our, our conservation and preservation instincts sort of kicked in right away, although this is a 1960s and 70s and 80s project, and one I, you know, lived in for five years of my life and respected and learned from. And so we kind of had no choice in terms of the siting, but we thought how would we use it to kind of really hold many fragments that otherwise existed in the campus. And here, like I said, the users, uh, the users, the you know, the, the building committee who were all either my colleagues from school or people who had been senior to me in architecture school uh, were, the, were, the, were the operational clients, the users were the students and faculty who also I knew and could access because I'd been a student there myself. And of course, the patron clients were the Ahmedabad Education Society, who are the ones who actually fund it. So this meant many discussions and public uh, uh, meetings and getting students and faculty involved and getting inputs. And it was a very complicated project. But what we really did, which was uh, risky, was to put the building three floors below the ground because we didn't want to disturb the datums that existed on the campus. And so we began to relate to every datum that had been implicitly established in Doshi's buildings and tried to respond to it, but in a contemporary way. You know, there was a lot of pressure to use exposed brick and exposed concrete. And finally, we kind of moved away from it uh, to create uh, through formal interventions, uh, something that was more compatible uh, with, uh, with the campus. And it turned out to be a building, it turned out to be three buildings that are nestled in each other, an outer building that's performative in terms of climate, uh, the next uh, building, which is the reading rooms, uh, the, you know, the reception areas, the kinds of 
receptacle spaces. And then within that, there's another building, which is a building, which is the, the book stacks. Each building has its own logic, sectional logic, right? So the outer building is 4.5 meters floor to floor. The next one is 3.4 and the inner one is 2.4. So all their sections stagger. What this does is two things. One is, is it creates a very interesting space. We've carved out a courtyard. So you actually bring natural light all the way down, but you begin to establish by the staggered section uh, a, a, a diagonal, a set of diagonal vistas. Because one of the challenges was if you went, if we had just done three floors down slab after slab, you kind of get a sense of claustrophobia. But by carving out these courtyards and then by sectionally staggering the spaces, you begin to get very highly extended views. So you don't feel claustrophobic because you can at least see two or three levels at any given time. And from most spaces, you at least see some space which has natural light. And so that is uh, really um, the way we kind of solved, uh, you know, making the decision to go three floors below the ground. Above the ground, uh, it picks up on these datums. It's this concrete base with uh, operatable louvers on the top, which can be completely open to create porosity, or they can be partially closed depending on the sun angles. We've done a manual for the students uh, to actually learn and operate these. Uh, and, uh, and you know, it sits on a podium. Again, it captures all the datums, as I mentioned to you, uh, in terms of establishing them for compatibility for the building. And here you see the different buildings. You see how it relates to the original buildings on the campus and how the datums get uh, established uh, and how, you know, the change of material uh, actually creates a completely different vocabulary. As the concrete begins to go below the ground level, it starts getting lighter and whiter so that it gets more luminous. The buildings are connected by bridges. So there's a kind of real uh, separation. Uh, the ground floor is an ambiguous space. It's meant to be multi-purpose for reviews, for students to hang out, for exhibitions, uh, but it's a kind of changing space. Uh, and here again, you see how uh, the different layers sort of operate. Uh, as you go further down into the building, you see the concrete color changing. This is the courtyard at minus uh, four meters. Uh, these are the stacks. This is the inner building. Uh, it's silent within, but you can step out to the courtyard if you want to have discussions. These are the diagonal views I was talking about. And what you see as glows are all natural light. Uh, and what you see with those kids sitting at that lower floor, that's nine meters below the ground. Uh, and so you yet have that natural light uh, filtering there. And this is that inner building, which is eight feet, so that you can reach books uh, very easily. This is the lowest level where just these three portals create the structure. All the services are integrated in the book stack. So the concrete is left very pure. And this is light that comes in from the courtyard uh, above. Uh, and as you go up, it gets much lighter. It's more porous, more transparent. They're reading rooms. Uh, you, um, you, know, you, you, you can operate these louvers. This was during construction, but there's a detail for a harness in that rail. So you can wear a harness and walk on, uh, on the catwalk uh, to adjust the louvers. This is the manual we developed which students could sort of use. And at night, of course, it takes on a completely different presence uh, because it begins to uh, uh, you know, reverse its luminosity. And the base is occupiable. People eat lunch there, they work there, they're looking into the library, but yet uh, on, on an other threshold uh, outside. And so that's what sort of it feels like uh, at night when you, you know, sit in these sort of alcoves. I'll now come to my last project and I'll take 10 more minutes and I think I should be absolutely on time. Uh, this is a government project which gets even more complicated and um, it's a, it's, a, it's a project for low cost housing uh, for a hundred elephants and the mahout. Mahouts are the people who look after elephants. And you know these elephants, um, this is a project in Jaipur in Rajasthan, which is a desert climate. And there's no reason these elephants should have been there. Uh, they came with the Mughals with, you know, because these are tropical beings uh, and they came for ceremony. You can see they're not in good health. You can see how, uh, uh, you know, the year of the elephant isn't sort of, uh, you know, expansive and uh, it's discolored, the skin is discolored and wrinkled. Uh, and the Mahouts are uh, largely uh, from, uh, they're largely Muslim, uh, they're poor, they, um, uh, they earn about $100 a month, $150 a month with tips, uh, and they have a big responsibility looking after the elephants. 
the elephants, of course, um, uh, are used for tourism. This is from the New York Times in the 60s uh, when American tourists began to go uh, to India. And this fantasy of you know, feeling like you're a Maharaja for a day riding around with these elephants. Now they continue to you know, work for more middle class and more economic kind of uh, tours. Uh, so they yet take uh, tourists up and down the ramparts of different forts. Their skins are painted, uh, which is very toxic. That's what creates the discoloring. And the site we got was a very nondescript site. It had no trees on it. It was, it was a desert landscape. Uh, what you see at the bottom is where the government was housing the elephants. And the elephants were like cars in a garage below and the mahouts lived above. And as you can see in the left of that image, the mahouts began to start living down with the elephants because the relationship between the mahout and the elephant is incredibly complex uh, because you know this is a beast that can get pretty violent. Uh, and uh, the mahout finds ways of creating a relationship with them and bonding with them and being able to control them. And so for, we made uh, water the chief protagonist in the project. We made it a landscape project. We said, you can't privilege architecture in a project like this because unless we have water, unless we can simulate a kind of feeling of being in the tropics and we can keep the elephants healthy, uh, what is the point of doing grand architecture? And this was a competition. And I, I must admit, and you know, I know my other colleagues who participated in the competition, they all really fetishize the traditional uh, puns, which were where elephants, the elephant stables. Uh, and so they were very architectural eccentric projects. And ours was a landscape project. It was about how we would capture water through micro dams, what species we would use, and how we would regenerate this landscape uh, to create a viable environment. And architecture was not what we privileged. And looking at Google image, we could see the kinds of uh, channels uh, that sort of existed. And we came up with a site plan with these micro dams where we actually put the lands, we privileged the landscape where uh, the terrain, the topography uh, and the inherent kind of logic of how the water was moving was given precedence over where architecture was placed. So really architecture was placed in the interstitial spaces. That usually happens with landscape. Architects and urban designers create an imagination and then landscape finds its way in the interstitial spaces. Of course, that's now reversing as we've come to privileged landscape. Uh, um, and often that is the correct way uh, uh, to approach a project or a problem. And so anyway, that became developed with you know, planting plans and all of that. And really what we achieved in 2007, when we visited the site, that's what it looked like. Uh, for two or three years, the project went very slow, but we managed to excavate the ponds. And in three years, it generated. So that hill that you see in the back there is the same hill you see here. It completely transformed the landscape. And now in 2017, 10 years later, that's the same hill. Uh, you see it's almost, in parts, it's a forest. We, of course, did not not pay attention to the architecture. Uh, we broke away from the row housing the government wanted, which is the brief they gave us, and we converted them into courtyard houses with a hierarchy of courtyards. They're very small houses, 300 square feet, but by adding a courtyard, you expand the house by 50 or 60 square feet. By making a flat slab, you allow them to occupy the terrace. And then if these three families get on well, they have a large courtyard and it really becomes uh, like a mansion. Uh, and then also the relationship between where the mahout lives and where the elephant sleeps is also kept and uh, you know, articulated mindfully while creating that court to be secure you know, for children uh, and others. And then the roof is used to store the, the, the feed, the fodder for the elephants, so it also acts as insulation. It's, it's a low cost housing project for a low income group. So uh, there was very little leeway. One had to very intelligently articulate this to maximize comfort in a sense. And that's when it first got built in the background. You see the Amber Palace where they take tourists up. This is when the first water body was done and the, 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 the first sets of houses had been built. Uh, and, uh, and you know, we kept these openings so the children could fondle the elephants without being threatened by them. Uh, we never painted and plastered anything. Again, we didn't have the budget, but expecting that people would col colonize these homes as they were given occupation and ownership. And that process is yet ongoing, even after so many years. And so each family treated their cluster differently, depending on, you know, their own the impulses in a sense. And here you see a Mahut coming home after a day, uh, his wife and uh, child greeting them. 
Uh, some folks, um, uh, you know, have lawns. And this is interesting because here also, by default, we altered an inequity because in Jaipur, even the middle and the upper middle class have to buy tankers of water because water is not available. It's a desert climate. Uh, but here, the poorest in that society uh, have more water than they need. So they use it for gardening. They have lawns, which is the fantasy of the upper class. They grow flowers, which they sell, uh, and they have a pretty wonderful environment. And again, we didn't set ourselves to design this, but through the feedbacks of observation, we've realized that its architecture has amazing agency. Uh, and it's these little moves that can create forms of empowerment that are mind blowing. Uh, it's just that we don't ask those questions. And that's why I think uh, situating the context you work in, in within the landscape of the most difficult and wicked questions and problems uh, actually nourishes the way we think of solutions. And I think that is really what is critical uh, for us as practitioners. And then of course, life corrodes architecture. You know, the kitchen they converted into a bedroom. Now they cook out in the courtyard. The trees are growing. The goats have arrived. Uh, you know, the atmosphere is changing. Uh, here, this, the, this is a family that gets around, three families that get on very well. They'd just been allocated their homes. So they hadn't really even done anything, but you know, they had this chicken, which they would, uh, you know, they had eggs and they, so it was like a little mini poultry farm uh, they had running there, which was just wonderful uh, to see. That's a before and after, just to give you a sense of the spectrum of the transformation, the dish antennas come in, which means sort of life is thriving. Uh, and, you know, the water made a big difference because uh, what the water did, we didn't realize. One is it made the elephants healthier. But what it really did by default, which again, we weren't conscious of when we started was it created an amazing relationship between the elephant and the mahout because this act of bathing the elephant when the elephant is very comfortable is what really makes them befriend the mahout. And you can see here how much healthier they look uh, and this, this rubbing the elephant's body and cooling it down is, is just, it's amazing. I mean, the Mahouts told us this was a single most important thing for them because the control now they have on these animals is much greater. And that's an image that was taken in the summer when the water was the lowest. And of course, these are local species that are stabilizing the soil. This is another interesting story. This wasn't in the brief, but the Mahouts told us that, look, elephants are very social beings. They need to hang out with their buddies for a while. And they said, you must give us some pavilions where they can do that. So just using leftover material, those are steel pipes and very minimal, we made these pavilions where different elephants could be tied together for a few hours. So they made friends and hang out and it would keep them calm. But the children of the Mahout, who are teenagers, who all use social media, they saw this as an economic opportunity. And they set up a site called Elephantastic. Uh, and now you can book a bathing appointment with the elephants. You pay 500 rupees. And you can, as a tourist, go there and have a bath with the elephant, or you can feed the elephant. And you know, you know, for another generation, they are what their social media page is. And so now they have income generating uh, through this sort of form of tourism, which is young people who'd like to go just photograph themselves with elephants or bathe the elephant and all of that. Similarly, something that wasn't in the brief was this little guest house. Uh, and we kind of convinced the government that, look, if you had something that was little upmarket, where you charge tourists even $200, but had only four rooms, almost like a boutique hotel, which the wives of the elephants could run as a cooperative, uh, and you could earn some money, and people interested in conservation and animals, animal welfare, could come and live and be part of this sort of environment, and even interact with the Mahouts, veterinaries, doctors, and you know all of that. And so this was something we kind of came up with an idea, and the government bit it. And it's a very simple sort of four-room house uh, with a veranda near the dining room where you can look out from and watch the landscape around. You know, this is a mapping we did, which is a very interesting mapping where we mapped what you see below the political party in power. The, in black, you see the different agencies who are our operational clients. The political party was our patron because the chief minister of the state initiated the project. The only constant in this whole game was the architects, which is red. And that's when we learned, it was really through this project that we learned that really we became the agents who were negotiating on behalf of the Mahouts 
with the public works department who also didn't have access to the chief minister, but we did. And so here was a case where you had three differentiated segments of the client who actually had no connection with each other. We became that bond and recognizing that actually empowered us in beautiful ways in order to even achieve uh, something like this. Uh, and you know it's a it's a it's a it's it's a mapping with correspondence and many details. It's uh, it, I did this for an exhibition at the GSD, but it's a wonderful archive because it tells you how uh, it, when when projects like this are in flux because no one is really interested through the project with the consistency that we often are. And so understanding the patron client, the operation client, and the users really was a very uh, in, it was an insight that I think we really. Uh, enjoyed uh, working with because it, it allows us to understand projects in different ways. These are just some before and after. And now, you know, these pavilions are being built in every cluster. There's much more, many more water troughs. You can see how the trees have grown and transformed the landscape completely. There wasn't a tree when we moved into the site. Uh, here, you, you know, we've done a kind of information booth. We've created this kind of gateway to define the entrance so that it becomes, you know, it has a kind of identification. Uh, we've done a handbook for proposals for different infrastructure improvements uh, and, um, you know, and all of that. This is a Photoshop um, image that we had made very early on where we had said our aspiration would be to create a kind of wetness in this de desert landscape. And we, are, we aren't quite there, but we are getting there. One of the Mahouts on his phone took this image and sent it to me a few months ago when the monsoon broke in Jaipur. And I was pleased to see that same water body I showed you with the elephants bathing. Now the water has risen to the top and you can see how the green has overtaken kind of the landscape and the lowest parts of the property are because where the water accumulates is literally like a dense forest. So with that, I'm going to end just my last thoughts, which are that I think, uh, you know, for us in retrospect, the practice of research came out of asking this question of, you know, how do you take every project and a kind of very specific context and place it in and interrogate it with the larger forces that surround you, which is forces of the urbanization of poverty, the, the notions of aesthetic and aesthetic modernity. In places like India, social modernization started way after aesthetic modernization had begun with Corbusier and a first generation of Indian architects. And so there are many disjunctures like that which create this context of the context, which you have to be mindful of in order to nourish the decisions you make as a designer. Uh, otherwise, we might as well, well, well wear blinkers and kind of design very site specific things. And that's when architecture become, becomes autonomous. And urban design really is that bridge practice, uh, which is where I see myself situated, which is one that creates the feedback loops between the site specificity of architecture and the abstraction of planning uh, and creates therefore by nature has to be about activism and advocacy uh, because it's about creating these feedback loops that allow uh, the feedbacks we get from site specificity to feedback to planning policy and alter planning policy to affect site specificity. Uh, and there, I think books and research become very critical instruments of that advocacy. And I think uh, we have to be advocates. Uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, I hate it when people say, is this social architecture? Not all architecture is about society. And uh, I think really society invests in us a lot uh, to help society imagine better spatial possibilities in which we can lead our lives. And I think architecture can be very instrumental in doing that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Raul. I want to invite uh, Professor Sasha Deltz to moderate our Q&A, and please feel free to put questions into the chat, uh, into the Q&A function. Um, and Sasha? Yes, uh, thank you, Dean Curry, and thank you, Raul Meltra, for this great lecture. Um, it was very, very nice and fascinating to see this bandwidth and broadness of your practice, both in research and, and, and architectural practice. Um, as Dean Curry just mentioned, I will um, moderate this Q&A session. So uh, I will indulge myself to post first question or, or a comment, and then uh, everybody can actually pose and set their questions in the Q&A function, and I will try to uh, replicate them into the room and ask Raul um, um, what you have been asking in the Q&A questions. Um, 
you can also do that in, do this in the chat, um, regardless uh, what is more comfortable for you. So uh, coming back to uh, to the lecture. So again, thank you very much. It was great uh, to see finally in person what or you telling in person what you're doing, um, because as not just me, but I hope many of us have been confronted and uh, fascinated by your work, both uh, your research and your practice. And I would like to start. I mean, my initial question before before I, you started the lecture, I was you know trying to to pose a question that kind of relates your your research on the ephemeral and the, the and the uh, unpermanent and how this relates to the practice. And you actually said, you know, uh, what what concerns you in in the research drives your practice. And you basically answered this question. So for me, that's pretty clear in all three projects to a certain degree in different scales and different forms. As I could see some kind of, you know, uh, kinetic city or ephemeral uh, structures and spaces that kind of relate really back to the most extreme example from research that you showed um, on uh, Kumela. Um, so, if anybody else has a question regarding this, uh, of course, uh, pose them. And but but I would like to take up three quotes from your like from your talk that I I, I thought uh, work very nicely together. Yet uh, the last one is maybe more a provo provocation from my side. So uh, please excuse if if maybe I misunderstood you. But uh, so the first one I was interested in was this um, that you said that you show these images of Dubai and this capitalist um, landscapes and called it the landscape of impatient capital. At the same time, you said that you were interested in this uh, new economic paradigm, right? So kind of a counter counter uh, proposal of, you know, re, re, re question, uh, questioning or reinvestigating um, this capitalist mode of production. And then at some point you said, when you introduced the three client modes, uh, maybe you did it, as I said, as a, as a joke, but I, I take you literally <laughs> on this one, is that you say, you know, maybe um, if everything is conflated into one, you know, maybe a private client for a house, we architects do the best of our work without friction. And so this is what I would like to question you, because having seen your projects, I would argue um, the best moments or the, the, the most like very exciting moments from my perspective were the ones where you encountered friction, you had to redefine things. You had to re redefine what actually you know, um, economic production means, and you created different means of economic production through the architecture, the way you, you were thinking. So, no, is there I mean, something actually, you can? Are... I, can I, no, I like to respond to all of them. They're all very, very insightful questions. So, uh, let me start with the last one. Uh, and no, no, you know, you're right. And actually, even. Uh, in a single family house. I wish I had kept, I'd shown you two, three single family homes we've done where we've also used other research agendas and things like that. I mean, it's not that you don't have friction, but like you, you have a different kind of friction. Sometimes actually in single family homes are the biggest nightmares when you understand what their aspiration really is for a house and what might be an appropriate house to do. It's just that you don't have to negotiate such disparate uh, aspects you know, I mean, like say the Elephant Village, the chief minister is there's a whole different protocol and process to even approach her or him, right? Uh, then you have the public works department, which is like a thick bureaucracy, right? And then you have the poor Mahouts and the elephants, which is a completely different constituency. They're not only speaking different languages, but they come from completely different cultural paradigms. So it's much more complicated. And you're right. I think those frictions nourish the project. I mean, that's my whole point, that these sort of nourish the project because they challenge you uh, in, in much bigger ways. Uh, I think in a single family house, there are frictions, a different kind, but you can sit with people over a drink or dinner and sort them out often or not, or a coffee, let's say, maybe that's a better way to describe it. So I think, you know, the dimensions are different, but uh, yes, I mean, of course, there are also frictions in a house. Your first observation uh, about, um, you know, that you find the kinetic city in all these projects and the way one has dealt with it. Really, I think what I've come to learn is um, the 
the power of looking at the temporal dimension. You know, we haven't, whether in pedagogy or as practitioners, we haven't, we haven't grappled with time enough, uh, with the notion of time. Uh, and the temporal dimension is a very important one, whether it's about how you differentiate spaces that are used differently, or how you even imagine how parts of a building are built differently. And from that comes also the notion of reversibility. In landscape architecture, and I think that's one of the questions in the chat, I don't want to preempt your questions, but one of the questions that in the chat had to allude to landscape. Actually, in landscape architecture, you, you have to grapple with the, with the dimension of, uh, of time because you, you, plant and you, you, you plant and you wait for the transformation. I mean, what we experienced in Hatigao, I wasn't trained to experience. It happened by default. And because the project stretched over 10 years for political reasons and all of that, I began in retrospect understanding how beautiful uh, the time dimension uh, occurs in landscape architecture. And I wish it could be articulated more uh, strongly and better. Maybe they do it in their own way within the culture of the, of the profession and the discipline. Uh, but I think in landscape architecture, it's absolutely wonderful. All right. Um, so I'll get into the questions in the Q&A section and I'll try to kind of maybe um, go according to to, to questions and maybe you know putting together a couple of questions. So the first one I would say is more a practical one by Daniel Silva was a couple of questions which I would kind of put together in one big question about um, what building materials and methods an architect can use to design these temporary and ephemeral structures. You know, is you know this. Uh, if, if we follow your, your talk, this has very much to do with the context as well, but maybe there is something or maybe a, a, a thought or maybe one part of the building that might be more, um, you know, uh, more, more easy to, to obtain or implement these ideas. Yeah. I mean, I, it's hard to generalize an answer for that. I think it would be very specific to projects. So there, there are different ways you can answer that question. You know, for example, you know, in a, for a third year studio, we should be given, giving students a project to design a weekend home uh, that uh, when the kids of that family were teenagers, they would go and no one would come back for a weekend and you should be able to dismantle it. So how would you design a house that had to last only for 15 years? Right. And then you ask different kinds of questions then. So that's one way of asking it. So it's about being dismantled. Can it be reused? I mean, that city I showed you, which they make out of five materials, they reuse all the material in the hinterland. It goes to small villages, the light posts, everything gets recycled. So that's kind of one way of looking at it. I just was talking to a friend in India. Some of the Indian students might know his name. His name is Sanjay Prakash. He designed one of the first mud structures in Delhi in the 80s called Mitigar. Ghar. It was for development alternatives. He just wrote to me to say they are now going to demolish it, but it's an earthen building. So they're going to document the installation because the mud is just going to go back to the site. And they're actually planning the demolition in the way with using water and things, they can let the mud dissolve back into the site because it was excavated from that same site. What a, what a very beautiful kind of moment, right? The other way you can think about it, which I think which, which begins to bring in conservation thinking. I mean, I think, you know, if you think about conservation and the practice of conservation, all the problems that you as a conservation architect solve lie at the, mo at, lie at the point of contact between two materials that have different life cycles. Right, uh, so a wooden beam going into a stone wall, the wood will rot. Then you've got to put a metal plate to hold the wood and all of that, right? So the material cycles in a building are different. We often just combine materials without thinking about the material cycle. It's also a temporal dimension, right? So if you can mindfully separate the different materials, materials with different material cycles, so you can actually be replacing things or transforming the building by, so let's say the base of the building is in stone, um, yeah, and you know you might build another floor, so everything above it is made lightly in steel, which touches the stone at very minimal places. You begin to separate these materials of different life cycles. So my point is just this, that we have to, if we bring the imagination of time and we use those as constraints, then our decisions will follow. Uh, it's not a matter of this material or the other. It's a matter of bringing time in and, 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 and articulating those aspirations on a temporal scale then you will rearrange uh, the kit of parts differently. 
And that might be a way to, to think about this. All right. Um, there's a question by Xin Xin Yun Sang about whether um, uh, landscape is ephemeral as well. But I, I think you I answered that. That's you, the you covered that, that beforehand, you. right? Just yeah. to, to be diligent about <laughs> questions. So um, then there's another technical question, which I don't know whether it could be answered or not. Uh, Alec Long asks, "What do you think the role is of digital and augmented reality in an ephemeral city?" Well, you know, well, is that a know, factor or not? Yeah, oh. it's not. But the point is, take ephemeral city out of your question. Just ask the question of what is the role of digital augmented reality in cities? You know, so then that becomes a broader question. But, you know, I think augmented and digital, uh, digital and augmented reality is going to become a reality in a sense. Uh, they I, and, you know, it can be used in different ways, right? It can be used to augment reality, as the word says, as fighter jet pilots use, correct, uh, to create other forms of connections and networks uh, and information gathering. And so, therefore, in a city, it can be used as societal networking uh, or otherwise. And it doesn't have to be an ephemeral or uh, actual, you know, city built out of brick and mortars. But I think in an ephemeral city, I think your question is interesting in the way you've placed it in the ephemeral city, it, it becomes a kind of hyper ephemeral. So like going to the Kum Mela, for example, uh, you know, there are many rituals and there, which then begin to take on a very kind of grounded uh, feeling, both in terms of the decibel levels of the noise and all of that. And one could imagine uh, that even the occupational dimension of the city uh, could use uh, the augmented and digital in 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 uh, in very interesting ways. Essentially, the digital. See, look, cities are an ecology. Cities are an ecology of many domains, and I believe uh, the digital. What the digital can best do, and what augmented reality can best do, is create those interrelationships between the domains with real time information sharing, but real-time networking, right? That is the power of the digital. And for that, you have to accept and understand the city as an ecology of different domains. Uh, and you do that, then whether it's an ephemeral city or otherwise, uh, I think the digital and augmented play a similar role. All right. Um, I have a question a bit from a more um, higher, higher level of, of scale. Um, and, and framework from Faiza Moatisim, who's um, part of our faculty here. And I will just read to be sure not missing something, the whole question. Um, she first thanks you for the fantastic talk, of course. And you started your talk with a call to move away from binaries in the way we think about architecture and urbanism. As you know, for long cities in the North and South have been seen as places of opposition. Could you please share your thoughts on how we bring how we may bring into conversation urban practices and processes in diverse contexts like India and the United States that share many contemporary urban conditions, such as urban poverty, environmental degradation, and informality. Yeah, uh, I don't know, that's a, it's a very good question and could be an interesting lecture in itself. Uh, but uh, uh, yes, absolutely. You know, uh, as, as they say, well, I, I'm, I don't, I don't use the categories of global north and south, nor do I use the category of developing and underdeveloped and developed worlds. Uh, so, but I'm just going to use it just for simplicity. But as they say that um, in every developed city or in every city in the developing in the developing world, there is a developed city, and for every developed city, there's a developing city inherent in it, right? So the informal city exists in New York. It's just that in Bombay, it's 90%, and in New York, it's 2% or 10%, right? The proportions change. Uh, and so therefore, I think, um, yeah, I think my arguments really with uh, the research and the propositions of the theoretical uh, or the attempts to create a theoretical framework around the ephemeral, the kinetic, and all of that is not to say it's one or the other. It's exactly what you have pointed out, which is to dissolve the binaries, is to, is to create the space for each other, which is to say that in, in cities in the West too, uh, you know, we, 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 we are often locking ourselves into 
permanent problems, uh, permanent solutions for temporary problems. Again, it's the temporal dimension, right? Look at the 3,000 abandoned shopping malls in North America. It's mind blowing, correct? For the amount of investment of materials. How do we anticipate what might change? How do we know what is a temporary problem and what might be on a temporal scale or longer uh, time uh, scale problem, which means then you can invest your resources in that proportionality. We don't seem to do that. Everything, uh, like I said, permanence becomes a, a kind of a default condition. So really, I think in the same way as we talk about a developed city in an underdeveloped you know, country or whatever, uh, or a part of the city that is a developed part of the first world is in every third world city. Uh, I think we have to also create the spaces uh, which are tentative, spaces which allow uh, solutions which are on smaller temporal scales where something is built with an understanding that it would be there for 10 years because we'd have to re-examine how retail might be done in 10 years, right? For example, I think the same should happen for medicine. The same, same should happen for many aspects of social and physical infrastructure. Uh, Arjun Apudarai called these the weapons of mass construction because the way flyovers and freeways have ripped our cities, they are really destructive. Uh, and so uh, there are forms of infrastructure that you can predict what the temporal uh, longevity will be, and there's some you can't. I think we have to be able to nuance that better. I think uh, that's sort of one response to your question. The other is I'm very inspired by, there was a Bangladesh, there's a photographer in Bangladesh called Shahid Al-Alam, Alam, and he uses the word, he used it for a photography biennale he was organizing because he's a photographer, but he called it the majority world. He cut the slice in a way where the majority of the world's population resides. Uh, and that's a, that's a different imagination because then that begins to uh, you know, bring in questions of density of resources. I mean, there were two Dutch architects who for the Rotterdam Biennale did this wonderful mapping of the world where they showed, uh, you know, what we call the global north, how it has 27% of the world's population and controls 80% of the, uh, you know, 73% of the uh, resources. And what we call the global south is it's the opposite, which has only 20% of the world's resources, but 80% of the population. And what they showed was all the contested borders, whether it's Mexico, America, whether it's you know the Korean border, all the contested borders are the borders where these two worlds actually make physical contact, right? So there, there are many ways that one can actually create these definitions. Then of course, the question becomes, how do you dissolve them? And that is very complicated. Uh, uh, and yes, of course, one can learn uh, from each other, but there's a limit to how much that learning could. I mean, I would jokingly say, because, you know, when I was at the University of Michigan, um, uh, Milton, I knew him in that incarnation. Um, you know, I used to do a studio uh, in the winter in Detroit, and I would do a studio in the fall in Mumbai. And one day it occurred to me that if I bought 5 million people from Mumbai to Detroit, I'd solve the problem of both cities. So that's, I mean, one extreme way of thinking about it. But uh, till we have these differences and these inequities in resource and populations, uh, there is a certain amount we can learn from each other, but then there are upper limits there too. Sorry for such a long response. Like that's, I said, this could great. be a lecture, <laughs> Yeah, that's great. So, so you, you might say, you know, that there's, I mean, there's of course, as you say, differences in context, but there are some topics that are trans, transversal you know, or yeah. vertical, you know, poverty, yeah. you have poverty everywhere. Yeah. Um, so you could, you could, you know, dissolve these these notions of this south and north um, dichotomies, mm -hmm. maybe on a on a very specific thematic level, maybe. Yeah. Um, so then I have a question that goes into education, which I think is, is also good because you've been educating for a long time, already. So uh, Michael Anderson. Um, says that he was he was uh, very fascinated by um, this this coming together of architecture landscape architecture and designer and planner um, um, and the outcomes that these these marriages had and he asked uh, if you think that this kind of combination should become a standard part of education yeah michael the way i'd answer that michael i think collaboration should become a, a standard part of education i mean i think there is disciplinary integrity which we have to also be careful about uh, establishing because if you dissipate all of that then also agency is lost and the 
culture, the cultures and the integrities that come around uh, uh, disciplines is critical. But I think uh, what should be embedded in education is just the constant collaboration. What I learned from the Kum Mela project more than anything else, it was celebrated as an interdisciplinary project. And the fact that people from the School of Religion went with the public health, went with design, went with business, went with technology and all worked together on this. I, um, in reflection, uh, I think the only reason that worked was the selection of the problem, which was by default. It was just happened to be of interest to me and a whole lot of other people got interested. But it was a completely out of the box question, right? I mean, we were 40 kids, students from all these disciplines doing a seminar, preparing them to go for this. We were 10 faculty. You know, truly no one knew what to expect. We're going to a temporary ephemeral mega city. What does that mean? Even I had no idea what to expect, right? So all our guards were down. No one discipline had the privilege of the knowledge over the other. The designers were scared out of their pants because they didn't know how they're going to map an ephemeral mega city, right? The public health people said, my God, how, what are we going to understand? But then the designers relied on the public health people because the public health questions became even bigger, right? The, the, the students from the School of Divinity, the Divinity School, the School of Religion, they actually knew the logic of what was happening, but they didn't know how it transforms physically. They knew what the rituals were about. They knew. So everyone depended on everyone to find. So I think I would say for pedagogy, for all of us who are in pedagogy, and that's the rubric I use, that's why I use extreme urbanism, is if you find and define a problem that no one group can claim kind of leadership and privilege in terms of setting up the first steps, then you have true collaboration. So I think we have to think more in the way we structure problems. Like I said, even a simple problem like a studio, instead of saying, oh, design a weekend house where everyone fetishizes material, you say you design a weekend house that can actually be back to the earth in 15 years, or it can be completely reconfigured in 15 years. That's a whole different parameter. So, I think our questions and our challenges must come out of our contemporary problems, uh, which there's an abundance of. That should feed into pedagogy to define these wicked problems or wicked questions or whatever, however you might want to define it. And then that would result in collaboration, both vertically and horizontally, uh, which could be very interesting. So which means the kind of spatial dimension of the structure of our pedagogy must change to not make it so linear and hierarchical, but to allow these interdisciplinary um, occasions through the problems we define. If we don't define the right problems, we, we can't make that happen. That's that's a great answer. And it reminds me somehow of a colleague of mine who has an office um, with two others. And he's, he's a sociologist. Second partner is an architect and the third is a urban planner. And so they, they kind of have this, this triangle of different disciplines and the way they, if they can financially, but the way they try to approach the projects is that they choose projects where none, none of them has kind of the high ground of coming from their discipline. So they, they really, what you just said, you know, they basically challenging them from the, themselves from the start and set up a kind of um, leveled playing field for all of them. So that's, that would be actually a nice um, way to, to approach some, some of these interdisciplinary projects and studios. Um, I have a, another one a question that was a little bit earlier, but I think might be also interesting to talk about coming from education to more the political sphere. Sanjit Mehta is asking whether um, the project in Hatigon changed over time due to political in interventions, I think that's the project in Hyderabad, yeah. uh, or if any, or any other urbanism project that was affected by the influence of outside architecture urbanism yeah. challenges. So, the, how uh, how how resilient is the architecture towards political change? So, I think the the question is about the Elephant Village, and uh, I think yeah, it 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 yes. actually was completely political because. You know the 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 BJP party. Uh, anyway, it was a very interesting story. The chief minister uh, from the BJP party uh, kind of uh, floated the project, and 
she floated it, Vasundhara Rajay was the name of the chief minister. She floated it because animal right activists from both abroad and India lobbied her that these elephants were being very badly looked after. So she's got a competition going and um, we got appointed after the competition and we you know, started work. That's where that three year lapse was because the government collapsed and the new government, the Congress government that came to power didn't want to have anything to do with the project. Uh, and then it kind of lay for a while and then the BJP comes back and it takes them three years to get reinterested in the project. And that is where we were doing a lot of lobbying and you know, meeting them and writing to them and uh, getting it going on behalf of um, you know, the Mahouts and the elephants who needed it because they didn't have the infrastructure, just the houses were built. So that's why that mapping I showed you actually captures that. And in the original form, which is in the book working in Mumbai, I've put a little ex extract of that. Then you see the kinds of letters we were writing and you know what we were saying and trying to get everyone interested in the project. Again, now in economic terms, this is just for younger people. I mean, I could have done the same lecture and I could have called it cross subsidy because each one of these projects cross subsidizes the other. Some go fast and you make a little profit. Some go on for 15 years and you are spending the money. And I think that the, the, the thing is you can either work at a, on a project on a project wise basis and its own profitability, or you can look at it again as an ecology where you say, you know, we're going to have 10 projects. As long as the end result is that we can pay everyone's salary, we are fine and we have enough food to put on the table. Uh, but in a place like India, if you have to grapple between what might be projects which actually become partly advocacy, uh, then you, you kind of create this internal cross subsidy. So in economic terms, that's how you can sustain a project for so long. It kind of becomes a commitment of another kind, uh, and which is hard to explain sometimes. But the project really, the short answer to your question is the project got delayed because of the politics involved. All right, um, I have one more question and I kind of got rid of it because of my technical inabilities. I tried to answer it by asking a more specificity in the question. It was posed by Esther Margulius, who's, who's also a, a part of our faculty in the landscape. Uh, architecture department. So if I recollect it correctly, um, she asked, um, how do you, how do you uh, engage or design or set up public engagement and public um, um, social, social level uh, engagement within such quickly changing uh, spaces and, and, and configurations? And I wanted no. to ask her whether it she clar wants to clarify it, whether it's meant to be part, is it related to the, the ephemeral city or in kind of the uh, developing world as such? This is- Oh, Daniel and she, she put in, so how, how to avoid the architect acting as a super being in relation to this, I would say. Oh my so God, there's a lots of probably she, she asks she, she she puts probably into question that you know can we as architects be be this uh, super being uh, trying to to do everything building but also negotiating on a on a civic level with, with people on the ground well we can at least aspire to we might fail but we can aspire to there's no harm in aspiring there's no there's no moral value in not acting uh, so is this the same person asking the question about the yeah, yes skyscraper and smaller scale no, project no 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 okay okay no no so i think the project was about public engagement and how one does it for these different projects yeah Sorry, if, got... it, if it or if it actually is it is it possible to do that in in in, in projects that change so quickly you know, I think it dif it's it's different for different projects. I, you know, again, this, these are hard responses to generalize. You literally have to each one. And that's why I think, you know, that kind of differentiating of what the client composition is, is very critical because then that tells you what your one or various constituencies are. And then each of those constituencies need a different kind of engagement, right? Uh, and so again, this dif differs, it differs from project to project. But I mean, even for us, 
I mean, we were very intuitively getting students involved, finding out what they wanted, talking to so and so. It's only later and doing the Hatiga project and reflecting and writing about it, one realized that really the, the, the heart of the problem is understanding the client and the client has to be understood in much more nuanced terms. Once you do that, you understand the varying aspirations. And sometimes on the same project, the aspirations can be very varied. Then the question is, how do you weave them together in a way that you, you, you kind of meet most of those aspirations, or at least as many as you can. Otherwise, it's the aspiration of one constituency or the other. It's not of both or all three. Uh, you know. So again, it I think varies. If I've understood the question correctly, I might have misunderstood the question. I'm sorry, I just found it again in my in my chat. How is public engagement addressed in such dense and quickly developing places? How does one monitor public sentiment? So you know that's more or less. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, again, it depends on the project. In some projects, you mm -hmm. have to worry about the public uh, sentiment. In others, you don't have to. Your constituency becomes clear. So for us, uh, in the you know in the elephant village, we weren't worrying about the public in the city. We were worrying about the constituency, which itself was very large because it was like home for them. Uh, and they were the center to it. And if one makes like in the university doing the library, the constituency was even bigger. It was 4,000 students and, you know, many other faculty and, you know, legacies and things like that. So one had to be, it was really the profession. It was the alum who had graduated. So it becomes even a bigger sphere. Uh, and so therefore then you have to find ways of communicating or at least establishing some feedback loops, some of which are productive and some are not productive. So again, I think the scale of that varies from project to project. All right, so um, I think we're almost um, at the end of our Q&A. So if you have, uh, maybe I'll hand over the last question or comment to the Dean, no, sorry, so that's, Fine for everyone. You think I so can just say one again. more thing, if you don't mind? No, of course. <laughs> no, you know, there's a question which is a very interesting question, which says that I'm when sorry. you talk about when you talk about the ephemeral, uh, you know, it, is it only small projects or can it be a skyscraper? Now, I think that's an interesting question, and I would answer it in two ways uh, because it's an important one. So it's not one or the other. I mean, I think skyscrapers are also important in the right place. I think architecture is an instrument to make cities is also important. It's not, it's not, again, we're not trying to create a binary. We're trying to find a way that both can coexist. And, you know, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank in Hong Kong, there's a wonderful book which is called Made to Order. Because what happens in that, uh, it, because one of the things that Norman Foster had to do was to raise the building on stilts because they had to let the hill and the vistas of the hill come to the water. So it's got this incredible space with these escalators that go up, right? If you go there on the, win on the weekends, you find about 2,000 Filipino maids who sit there and picnic. And that is their rendezvous point because it's actually a public space. And that's why it's called made to order because these women work as maids in the houses of rich Chinese, but they meet there on the weekends to recreate and they sit by communities from the villages they come to, etc. It's a completely ephemeral event. It's really quite bizarre and surreal because when you go there, it's this high tech building, you know, the high tech, high tech architecture, which has uh, this informal almost community hall that becomes a place on the weekend. So it, it's making the space for these kinds of events. It's not creating hard thresholds that separate what makes the city and its architecture and what makes its occupation and what is the ephemeral dimension of the city. I think that is the imagination we have to challenge ourselves with. Great, thank you very much again for your uh, answers and also for the participation of everyone in the Q&A and I'll get back to the email thank from you. Thank you, Raul. I very much appreciate uh, you know, what I would characterize as, as your um, consistency of kind of active provocations to, to the design community to, to think differently and to reframe architectural intention. And I hope that um, for all the students uh, watching that you'll, um, as I used to do when I heard provocative lectures, uh, go right back into studio and, and start bringing that thing into my projects and challenging myself. So I hope that you all do that. Um, thank you again. And, um, you know, your work is so um, relevant to the discussions we've been having at our school around urbanism and uh, both in Southern California and globally. 
Um, and so I, I look forward to opportunities to bring you here in person uh, as we would have hoped to, to do um, today. But um, we will find a way and we'll find uh, strategies to, to make that happen because we really appreciate your perspective. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you Sasha, Professor Deltz uh, for those wonderful moderation and thank everybody for coming. Um, we'll see you, um, uh, I believe, next week. Um, and look on our website for all of the great events that are happening. Um, thank you and have a great evening.